And speaking of which, President Trump set to meet with the new National Economic Council Director Larry Cutlow at 2 p.m. as China retaliates on tariffs to Price Waterhouse Coopers partner uh, Mitch Rochelle. Uh, Deirdre Bolton is with us as well as Connell McShane. Uh, let me start with you, Mitch. Um, your, how do you anticipate the, this this trade battle? This, uh, the salvos have been fired. Um, China's retaliated. It became official today, but we knew what they were going to do. The U.S. Trade uh, Commission now narrowing down the list of items uh, to be hit next. But everyone's sort of hoping that within that period that there's serious behind-the-scenes negotiations and it doesn't get much worse from here. Yeah, I think the tariffs from China are kind of ceremonial. It's 3 percent of all the imports. It's narrow to, in fact, some red states uh, like pork and some of the agricultural products. So I think there may be more to come from them, and there's probably going to be more to come from us. So it's going to be back and forth. And I think it's all part of an overall negotiation that's going to likely take place over time. Well, Darren, you're supposed to be 50 to 60 billion more from, from us. Our uh, side, from, yeah, indeed. from our yeah, side, indeed. And yeah. I think this is sort of part of what's weighing on market sentiment, right, is just this question of, okay, like, how far does this go? Mitch, to your point, I was reading through a few trade journals this morning, and they were saying, listen, as of now, China's response is limited by design, right? It is hardly, I don't know, it's three to five billion. I'm not saying that's nothing, but it's certainly not like the 50 to 60 billion that we anticipate. I think that the follow-up is just, um, from what I understand, that the Trump administration is basically treating the situation as we did with Japan in the 1980s, but the rule book may have changed. And we managed to do sort of a one-on-one -on -one deal with South Korea, but we've been an ally, right, for so long. There's this kind of positive relationship. It's not really slightly adversarial slash frenemy as we are with China. So I think that's all of the unknown that is current. Because so far from what we've seen, honestly, no big deal. But I think it's this just unknown what's coming is what's weighing on sentiment. Well, one thing about the Chinese, I think that they, oh, to your point, Charles, they had, they, we knew what they were going to do because they announced it already. But there was sort of a saving face par a portion of this for the Chinese, which is part cultural, which works its way into being an economic and political story. So to what Deirdre was talking about, that's one of the reasons it's limited. On our side, however, and I think I've said this from kind of day one of this uh, tit for tat back and forth trade discussion, I wouldn't bet against this president ramping it up. There seems to be on Wall Street still this assumption that we're going to have some sort of a deal. But at the heart of things, the, 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 the president is a protectionist and believes in those types of policies basically to his core, probably more than he believes in anything else economically. So I wouldn't bet against him ramping it up, and I think you're starting to see some of that concern. Even calendar-wise, like timeline-wise, I've seen that we're essentially giving China sort of 60 days to respond, and a lot of people are saying just the way that their economy works, even if they wanted to comply with everything that the U.S. wanted, right. it, they can't turn on a dime that it's actually not even realistic, but we'll see what happens. Right, right. But by the same token, uh, I think the market, I think Wall Street is also trying to pressure the White House, if you will. Right. I think some of this selling the day of the announcement and some of the subsequent selling is is wall street reacting even more so than china uh to, you know because i've seen the market push around the federal reserve i've seen them push around other presidents in the past and this is the first time wall street has been diametrically opposed to the white house and the president likes to take credit for the success on wall street so he's paying very close attention he likes ratings so there's a ratings point and when he sees the market react, they think it's going to move him. But yeah. Council, I'm with you. I, yeah, I think he he, he's not a on this issue, right? Not on this issue. Yeah, he's, a, think... he's a protectionist. Um, the interesting thing, you mentioned Kudlow at the top of the segment. I don't know how he and Larry Kudlow are going to get along on this issue, because I don't think fundamentally, if you look at what Larry said throughout his career and what he's written, they're not necessarily on the same page. Larry made it pretty clear, though, uh, upon accepting the job, uh, that he would try to voice his opposition to tariffs or, or increase tariffs but ultimately would accept whatever President Trump decides to do. He will be a team player. So it's sort of like one of you in, in, a, in a huddle, right? The wide receiver's like, I'm open, I'm open, you know? <laughs> but if you don't get to play, then at least help block for the other people, well, you know? That's, that's not what the other guy probably did. Well, that's why it's issue by issue, though, right? Because, I mean, that's what Mitch is talking about. Because if you said to me, is Larry Kudlow going to have an influence over this president? He said, maybe. Uh, certainly if the issue was taxes, you'd, you'd say yes. If it's the regulations, you might say probably. But if it's trade, I think Gary Cohn would be the first to tell you that the answer is probably no, and that the president already has his position on this. He's believed it for 30-plus years, and I don't think Larry Kudlow or anybody else is going to change that position. But if we look closely at the administration saying they want to cut the $340 billion in deficit by $100 billion, that's, a, that's an admission that they won't ever get it completely one-to-one, -one, right? I mean, that, so 
I think they've left themselves some room for a compromise. In other words, if China could come up with a package that doesn't force joint ventures, that allows for, for, for more, that does allows for less theft of intellectual property and, and also perhaps more, uh, you know, easier access for drug companies and others. Maybe you add it up and it comes out right. to 30, 40 billion. Yeah, and to your point, that th this is what it is all about, right? Drugs, pharmaceutical, IP, and also tech IP. That's, right. that's what and, this and is And don't about. leave out dumping, because that's a huge yeah. issue for manufacturers of all sizes when they just can't compete because China's manufacturing things at a cost that nobody else on the planet can, and they dump uh, either a finished good or a raw material on the market. Now, today, one of the hardest hit uh, niches within the market, RLX, uh, the retailers, and a lot of retailers are pushing back, not just on this, but also the idea of, of uh, ripping up NAFTA. Uh, you know, yeah. this, uh, this will be a, perhaps create a sort of de facto border tax that was initially talked about uh, by several members of Congress. I didn't think it was a good idea. So, so we've got a two-pronged fight. It's not just China right now. And by the way, the Chinese, just in general, I think the president's case that he's making against China, and we just kind of outlined or talked about part of it, has much broader support because it's very difficult to argue against the fact that the, that the Chinese are doing every single thing that we just talked about them doing, and you went through it list by list uh, or uh, item by item. Uh, on NAFTA, it's a little bit different, and, uh, you know, this is the one maybe there might be more concern about. Um, in markets. I think that, again, we go back to what we talked about at the beginning. I think there is an assumption that at the end of the day, there will be some sort right. of an agreement where there's not a tearing up of NAFTA. If we ever get that, that to the point where that is really on the table, then we got an issue. I, I just Great. don't know what, I, I kind of get a sense of what might be called a success with China because of some of the things we heard last week. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what success looks like for the White House with NAFTA negotiations. But yeah, but interesting nugget on NAFTA and the impact of the fear of a trade, trade war. When all the rhetoric about potentially ripping up NAFTA happened, last year there was a 2.5% drop-off in direct investment within Mexico. So non-government investment within Mexico fell just on fears that NAFTA could fall apart. Well, now uh, the peso fell apart, right? Uh, and, uh, you know, even when it comes to the border wall, during the campaign there was talk of perhaps taxing remittance. Last year saw a record. By November, it was $26 billion. Right. To put that in perspective, Mexican oil exports were less than $19 billion. Yeah, I, I think we are more interconnected than even the average person thinks about. And by that, I mean to Canada and to Mexico. I mean, we get a heck of a lot of energy from Canada. I mean, there's tons of industries. They were our largest trading been, partner. Exactly, yeah. that have been built over decades. Right. Um, and perhaps to your point, Charles, maybe the market is sort of freaking out more about what can happen with NAFTA versus China. Yeah. I, the bottom line, I think, is we've cut some bad deals in the past, and I don't think President Trump wants to rip any of them up, whether it's the U.S. Postal Service with Amazon and our fixed costs there that they just did not think that the uh, parcels would become this big of a business this quickly or the rest of the world. And, I, you know, listen, a lot of, I, I'm of the camp that if you don't push back now, uh, we, we probably have less footing to push back a year or two from now. It might be true. I think there's been a change right. in tone a little bit from this White House that even its biggest detractors would have agreed in the early days was nothing but pro-business. But now when you look at trade and you look at Amazon, even in the uh, Justice Department's lawsuit against AT&T and Time Warner that I was covering last week, it's a lot of these issues that are not, the, the, the position the White House is taking on them is not as pro-business. Well, right. it's, and it's right. traditionally a Democratic playbook. That's true, too. All right. Thank you all very much. Appreciate it.